Hello everyone. Today in the series of KO and interviews at Doplexes, we are we have with us Dr. Ashish Kumar Mukhopadhyay, who is currently uh, serving as the Vice President of Foxy and is currently working as Professor and Unit Chief at CSS College in Kolkata. Thank you so thank you for your valuable time. So to to begin with, we would like to ask that since uh, we all are aware of that LSCS is uh, increasing in the world due to various factors, so do you think it is it as an additional risk factor for postpartum hemorrhage? Oh yes, of course, because um, cesarean section as such, compared to the vaginal delivery, entails double the blood loss. So you can imagine that uh, every time we go for cesarean section. In contrast to the vaginal delivery, we are incurring that amount of blood loss in the patient. Roughly, the blood loss is 1,000 cc, 1,000 ml, but it can go higher. So, so can you highlight the major causes for PPH? And is uterine atony still the major factor or the cause of PPH in uh, cesarean delivery? No, oh, yes, uh, uh, atonic PPH remains the commonest cause of PPH, atony. That is, uh, we find in roughly 80 to 85 percent of cases. And the caesarean section has not changed the situation at all. In fact, you can face atony in during caesarean section also equally as you will face in the vaginal delivery. So then can you please share the associated risk factors with PPH in caesarean delivery? Well, uh, actually you are keeping the abdomen open. You can understand the uterus is exposed to the atmosphere. So it, it is not in touch with the body organs that time. So what happens, the uterus takes that extra time to contract. And that is why the extra amount of bleeding actually affects the patient. So I think caesarean section uh, poses more risk to the woman in terms of blood loss compared to the vaginal delivery. So then once it is recognized, what would be the preliminary method to you know, manage PPH in the beginning? That remains the same. You know, during caesarean section, you are asking me during caesarean section PPH what you should do. Well, it's a teamwork now. The surgeon uh, and the assistant, they are at the operating table. They keep on compressing the uterus and try to make the uterus hard as early as possible. The active management of third stage of labor has to be taken up immediately within 60 seconds of the birth of the baby. And then he actually shouts for help or calls for help to gather as many people in the OT as possible. I'll tell you how. The first assistant goes for a blood sample taking a blood sample for grouping, cross-matching and requisition of blood. And the same sample he carries and takes it to the patient party, the relatives who are waiting outside, handing it over, explaining the seriousness of the patient, taking their informed consent. That is the job of the first assistant, I mean, who is not in the uh, in operation, okay? The second assistant, his job is to maintain so many ecbolics or uterine contracting agents are available in the OT, all of them to be administered one after another. Say we can have methyl argometrine, you can have rectal misoprostol, you can have prostaglandin, all in quick succession so that the uterus is contracted. And the response he asks from the surgeon, whether the uterus is contracted or not. And the third surgeon, his job is to take a speculum and a sponge holding forceps and asking the OT nurse to separate the legs of the patient and standing at the foot end of the patient to see actually bleeding, how much is reduced or increased. So you need at least five people together during the situation of crisis of PPH during cesarean section. Um, uh, knowing that, uh, can you please elaborate the temporizing methods and uh, their effectiveness? Well, temporizing method, one of the methods I told you about the uterine massage. When the cesarean section is going on, it's open. So you go on rubbing the uterus uh, and keeping the uterus firmly close to each other in your hands wrapped by a towel. Okay, that's the first temporizing method. Secondly, if it is not uh, this thing uh, reduced, then you should go for another temporizing method that is, because the abdomen is open now, you should go for the stepwise devascularization of the patient, meaning the tying the uterine vessels, tying the utero over in anastomosis, and then going for internal ligation in quick succession. Now, uh, uh, once these things have been finished and the bleeding is still continuing, he should go for a brace suture, commonly the bilin suture or a modified bilin stitches. 
Even if it doesn't stop the bleeding, then you have to go for the ultimate measure. That is hysterectomy. Oh, great. So then do you still think that uh, selective arterial embolization is the best method to man manage uh, PPH? Or if not, then what do you consider as the best technique to manage PPH? Well, there has been a lot of controversy about this uterine artery embolization. Let me tell you very frankly. It's an emergency situation. It's a life-saving situation. In, in order to uh, save the life of the mother, you need to act very promptly. For selective uterine artery embolization, you need a very good unit in your department, first of all. They should be informed from beforehand with the logistics and other things ready. A close coordination between the OBGYN department, the OT and the radiology department. And also it takes some time to arrange all these things. Most importantly, this facility is not available in most of the state-run hospitals where the major brunt of this uh, PPH complication is we face. And therefore, I do not think, frankly enough, that uterine artery embolization is a very good method at this critical point of life-saving situation. I would rather recommend other temporizing situations and surgery when the caesarean section is on. So then is hysterectomy the best way to manage uterine hemorrhage or uh, there are other horizons to that? Well, we had a long controversy over five years over this issue, whether the hysterectomy should be done immediately. It is a life-saving measure. WHO has come out with some recommendation, let me tell you. And that was in the year 2009. WHO said that in an attempt to save the uterus of the patient, we need to go for the temporizing method. That means the breast sutures, the selective, I mean the um, stepwise revascularization, and then ultimately hysterectomy. But this is not a be-all and end-all. This is not sacrosanct. Whatever is uh, the surgeon is comfortable with at that particular situation of time, that means in an emergency situation, suppose a surgeon is comfortable with hysterectomy and not with a stepwise devascularization, let him go ahead and do that. There is no harm in doing that because it is life-saving of the patient. Mm -hmm. Suppose that somebody is not uh, used to or not regularly doing these breast sutures or selective, uh, I mean sorry, the um, uh, stepwise devascularization, he should not waste time on these things and increase the complications. Rather, he should go, go for a safer alternative of hysterectomy during this crisis period. But the person who is conversant with these techniques, he only should take up these issues. So WHO has got a uh, rider on this, that whosoever the surgeon is, whosoever the, in the practical scenario, whatever is comfortable to, and whatever is life-saving for the patient, he should go for that. So hysterectomy is not by any means the last end every, everything. But if you are conversant with that, fine, go ahead and do it to save the uh, life of the mother. Great. <coughs> so lastly, you would really like to ask that, do you think a platform, a medical platform, online platform of more than 1, like 35,000 doctors can play a role in sharing these recent advances to the gynecologist and, of course, the doctors at other specialties? Oh, definitely. I think the, the by inser insertion of simply uh, active management of third stage of labor, I believe that we have grossly reduced the number of maternal deaths over the last 10 years. So, I believe that these messages, when they are carried forward to the proper uh, you know, gynecologist or whosoever is practicing maternal health in the periphery, in the rural areas, if the messages are properly conveyed to them, I think they will do a great job in reducing further maternal mortality, and not only mortality, but also near-miss situations and morbidity. Thank you so much. We are really great, grateful for you to you that you shared your valuable time and we really look forward to this interview. Thank you so much. It was uh, wonderful for, on my part also. It was a privilege on my part. And let me share with you that if this message is conveyed down the line to the, uh, to the periphery, I'll be more than happy. Thank you very much. Same it was my pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you. These interviews and videos are brought exclusively for the members of Doclex's community. To stay updated about such upcoming events, we would request you to subscribe to our YouTube channel, like our Facebook page and follow us on Twitter. Happy Doc Plexing!